Welcome back, and now we're on to chapter one, following the introduction. And this is on the purpose and definition of the viva. Very important to uh, cover both definition and purpose, as it will give you a greater idea of what to expect and how really to pitch your performance. And indeed, let's remember that a viva is very performative being a face-to-face uh, -face live examination or oral examination. Now that sort of touches on the definition of a viva already, but actually before I get into that and extrapolate, I think it is worth us just briefly covering the definition of a PhD. And the, the two definitions, viva, PhD, are married to each other. We can't truly understand one without the other. So what is a PhD? Well, we all know the traditional definition, I'm sure. We've heard it, uh, we've heard that drum banged several times. It is a an original contribution to knowledge. An original contribution to knowledge. And certainly that is how the Board of Graduate Studies at the university will and do define a PhD. So we can we can afford to look at the, the slide here. Uh, this is taken specifically from the Board of Graduate Studies verbatim. So as you can see here it says um, doctoral degrees are awarded to those who have demonstrated all of the criteria below. Number one being a significant contribution to the field of study through the creation and interpretation of new knowledge, connection of previously unrelated facts, or the development of new theory or revision of older views. In a way, defining what a contribution is, what your contribution is, is part of the contribution, okay? There's no ready set formula to say this piece of information, this piece of research is important. You need to make the case as to why your research is important. You need to join the dots. And when I say you need to do that, that's the case both textually and verbally. In other words, it needs to be evident in the thesis itself, and you need to make that evident in the viva. That is what you need to speak to. Don't allow it to be assumed, inferred, implied. It may be quite easy to infer the contribution, the significance of your research, but even if that is the case, you still want to make it as clear as possible. You want to articulate precisely what makes it a contribution. And that contribution is likely to be sui generis, in other words, unique. That's what makes it a contribution. It's original. It cannot be um, presupposed in that sense. So contribution to knowledge is deliberately vague, deliberately abstract, because it is for you to make it concrete. That is part of the contribution. Now, if we move on to the second criterion, we see it says submission of work of a quality in whole or in part of a standard to merit publication. A standard to merit, merit publication. Now, that's a bit more concrete than the first criterion, but still abstract enough to be flexible. Because we should perhaps know by this point that the style, writing style, uh, pitch and so forth of a publication can vary quite a lot. But there is something nevertheless that is standard across publications. They have to meet a certain uh, a certain rigor. Okay, so your your reviewers, you know, your review when you, you hand in a an article to publish to a journal, the reviewers, they do not need to agree with what you have said. They just need to ensure that what you are arguing is substantiated, that it's built on solid ground, firm foundations. It's, it's not based on fictitious data or misleading data or false information or poor references or, frankly, 
outmoded interpretations, of which there are some, that even if it is interpretative, even if it is hermeneutic, it's still nevertheless substantial. It's, it's rationalised, it's well-structured, it's cogent, it's coherent. So that's really what the uh, examiners are looking for in your thesis, and that's what constitutes uh, a doctoral standard, which is really uh, an academic standard. Because, and I'll say this again many times, a PhD really is a licence to be an academic not necessarily working in a university, you could have any kind of job and still be a, an academic in a sense. If we take academic to mean an independent and autonomous researcher, somebody who can uh, pursue the work through their own volition and judge it um, according to academic standards themselves, you know, uh, imminently judge it. Let us move on to the third criterion. And I quote, provides evidence of the acquisition of knowledge and a detailed understanding of applicable techniques for research and advanced academic inquiry. So this is an element of look what I know. Very important for a PhD. When, when you come to do publications, although the PhD should be of the same kind of standard, it's, it has a different function. It has a different end. The publication is solely about the research. You're contributing to, to your field. A PhD does that, but it's also about you. Again, it's that license that you want to gain to be an independent scholar. And part of that is demonstrating that you know your field. You know the arguments. You know the canon or the accepted canon. Uh, you know what's gone before you. You know the tried and tested methods. You know the dead ends. And when I say you know all this stuff, I don't just mean in reference to your specific subfield, but the field more generally speaking. Uh, much like a, a medical doctor, you know, might specialise in a particular aspect of medicine, but should still have a, a general understanding of medicine, a general understanding of the principles of uh, medicine. So it's the same in this case. So your PhD inevitably is going to have more uh, detail, uh, more descriptive elements than a monograph, for example. And that's really, again, just to demonstrate that you know the field. So that's part of getting a doctorate. That's part of what you will be examined on. There's more to it than that. Principally, how can you possibly claim that your research is uh, unique or original or new or a contribution if you don't know what's come beforehand, if you are not capable of identifying identifying gaps or shortcomings. So, you know, for those of you who are writing a literature review, that's what the literature review is really doing. You're, you're looking at the field, identifying themes, what's worked, what hasn't worked, why, and how you can contribute to that, how you can make things better, how you can improve understanding. If you don't have a literature review, that's fine, but that, that kind of function will still be played out throughout the text. Your engagement with the, with the literature is really um, part of it, at least, is, is about positioning yourself, where are you positioned in relation to that research? What is your research doing in relation to that? So to go back to original contribution, it's a relational concept in relation to other pieces of research. Thus, it is important to demonstrate that you understand that research. The final uh, criterion says that the student needs to demonstrate their work is of a quality and quantity to reflect three years of full-time postgraduate study or five years part-time postgraduate study. Again, that seems a little bit vague, a little bit abstract, but I suppose when we really sit down and think about it, gauging what three years worth of work looks like is actually probably quite easy to do. We wouldn't expect, for example, 50,000 words, um, and I mean well-written words, in the first year. That's pretty unrealistic. It's not impossible, but it's, it's improbable. Three years, we would expect more than that. In fact, by the end of three years, we would expect a full PhD thesis, 80,000 words. Um, 
or perhaps a little bit after three years, thereabouts. So that's really what it means. Have you, have you produced the thesis up to a good standard quality? Is it cogent, coherent, concise, well-structured, well thought out, and so forth? That's really what it means, okay? So quality, concision, coherence, so forth. Quantity, 80,000 words. Pretty simple, really. Now, let's get on to the Viva. I've, I've talked extensively about the, the PhD. It's, it's touched on elements of the Viva, but let's talk about the Viva specifically. What is a Viva, or Viva, as some people call it? Well, it's short for Viva Voce, or Viva Voce. And for those of you who are fluent in Latin, I apologise for butchering what is, no doubt, a beautiful language. Alas, I'm not the only one to butcher it, and you'll find that a lot of people just call it the Viva. In any case, however we choose to pronounce it, right or wrong, Viva Voce essentially means by or with the living voice. By or with the living voice, the live voice conducted by speech. In effect, Viva means oral examination. But what is the Viva for? Exactly. Why are we having this dialogue? Why are we discussing the submitted work? Can't we just do what we do when submitting a journal article? That is, have two reviewers, maybe three, um, review the work, give their comments on it, and give the yay or nay. Why can't we do that? Why isn't that enough? Well, let's see what the university or the Board of Graduate Studies has to say about it. According to them, the oral examination gives an opportunity for you, the student, to defend your dissertation and clarify any matters raised by your examiners. For the examiners to probe your knowledge in the field. For the examiners to ensure themselves that the work presented is your own and to clarify matters of any collaboration. For the examiners to come to a definite conclusion about the outcome of the examination. I think the defence aspect is probably the most important. The examiners want to see that you are capable of engaging in an academic dialogue. I sometimes refer to that as a mature dialogue. Why? Because an academic dialogue is about the ideas, it's not necessarily about you. In other words, don't take a defensive position just because you feel that you are under attack when examiners are probing or colleagues are probing ideas. They are very much your ideas, but in an ideal scenario, we're presenting our, our ideas to a community and to the benefit of that community, the benefit of the research to which that community is attached. So we have this... Um, contribution of knowledge coming to the forefront yet again. It's simply not enough just to write ideas down. There might be some additional things that need to be defended and discussed that the, the writing um, that is absent in the writing. So this is the opportunity for the examiners to really probe you on that. And remember, although I've just said, you know, in an ideal scenario, this is about your research, it is also about you because you're trying to get a qualification. So the examiners have a duty to ensure that you do have that broader knowledge of the field that we talked about earlier and that you can join the dots and articulate what it is that you are contributing, why it is a contribution, how you arrived at that idea, what journey you undertook, what your story is. You can provide a narrative. This is a sort of peek behind the curtains, you know, the mechanism behind uh, the work. And... That actually reveals something else about the doctorate. That it's not just a contribution to knowledge. That's perhaps the main thing. But there are a vast multitude of skills that are involved to get you to that point. That are behind the curtain. So speaking to your journey, engaging in a narrative, gives you the opportunity to tell your examiners what skills you've engaged with. What skills you have enhanced what you have gone through yourself in order to produce this work. In other words, it's an opportunity for you to impress them. How many RDP workshops did you attend? 
Uh, what kind of time and project management skills did you use? What sort of contingency plans did you set in place? How flexible were you when you confronted a, a problem or delay in your research or a delay in getting data and so forth? How did you respond? How did you use your creative powers to overcome an obstacle? All these kinds of things are, are crucial. Related to that, it may be the case that the examiners are scratching their heads. You know, why did this student not do X, Y, Z? And you have a perfectly good reason for that, a good rationale, but it hasn't been made evident in your thesis because it wasn't a relevant place to discuss it. Well, again, the Viva examination is your opportunity to uh, speak to that, to, to rationalise your decisions, to join the dots. So that's really what we mean by defence. And of course, that what I've just said, that, that wonderful monologue, is it wonderful? I don't know. But nevertheless, that, that monologue does touch on the other points here as well, in terms of probing knowledge in the field, um, examiners assuring themselves that the work is yours, and allowing the examiners to come to a conclusion about the outcome. Okay. So that's the official reason why we do Aviva, and, and I believe they're pretty good reasons. But there are some unofficial reasons that we can cover as well, or that we can uh, identify. Uh, the Viva is also an opportunity for you to uh, understand your thesis and its implications. It forces you to uh, get out of your head. It's, a, it's quite a big difference keeping ideas internal and on the page and bringing them out and speaking to them. Uh, indeed, it's so different that many of us shy away from it. We're afraid of talking about our research because we have this little niggling awareness that it's going to expose some pitfalls, that it isn't all quite so together as we would like, which is all the more reason to do it. The more we talk about our research, the more we can clarify it, the more we can find those elevated pitches, those um, narratives that we can employ on the spot, but that also help give direction and uh, form to our ideas. And indeed, this is a really rare, unique opportunity to talk in a lot of detail about your research to what are ideally experts in the field and experts that have read your research. That doesn't happen often. It does not, not, not at that level, not for two, three hours. So this is an amazing opportunity. And remember, most people, friends, family, are sick of hearing you talk about your PhD at this point, if you're not sick of it yourself. Certainly I went through that experience, so it was incredibly refreshing to have two examiners who had read my work and really thought about it, really considered it, and helped me on my own intellectual journey and even helped identify areas for future research and encouraged me to undertake that future research. So there's a great personal benefit here in addition to just getting an award. That brings us to the end of this video. Quite a lot to cover there. If you didn't quite grasp all of it, try and watch it again. Maybe you'll get it the second time through. But uh, if there are still some niggling doubts, watch the other videos. It might it might cover might cover the ground that you're that you're seeking. Uh, but if not, I again emphasize or re-emphasize that you can reach out to me as well. So that's bye-bye for now, and I'll see you in the next video.